Hello Book 2. I went back to the Brattle. <laughs> I know that's going to surprise absolutely none of you. Nevertheless, <laughs> I went I went back to the Brattle. Uh, the, the, the Brattle Bookshop is a, a used bookstore here in Boston. They are old and they are wonderful. They have lots and lots of books and a heavy turnover of stock and an outdoor sale lot next to the shop that has thousands and thousands of books for usually for one dollar three dollar and five dollars so you you can buy whatever you want out there you're not going to bankrupt yourself and the prices indoors are extremely reasonable too but outdoors it's incredible and uh like everything else the brattle closed for the pandemic and has only just started toying with the idea of reopening they are reopening this week so they started by opening the outdoor sale lot right because that your, your chances, your risk there, even, even, I mean, you're wearing a face mask and you're trying to keep your distance from other people, but your risks are lower anyway, because you're, you're outside, you, as long as you're careful with your hands and you don't, you know, touch your mouth or your nose or anything, with, after touching all these books, you should be relatively fine. Uh, and they have recently opened the inside of the store as well. Again, using, just, just imposing very light, very sensible guidelines. Don't, Follow the motion arrows on the floor like you do at the supermarket so that you're not bottlenecking. Uh, try to stay six feet away from the nearest person. If they're browsing an area that you want to see, just browse somewhere in the area until they're done. Uh, wear a face mask. Uh, be nice to each other. The, the Brattle has stressed during this reopening that all of our nerves are on edge for all of this, from all of this stuff. So it's, an, it's worth an extra reminder to be nice. Be kind to everybody else. Oh. Whenever the Brattle comes to buy books, she screams at them. <laughs> and when she was a tiny, tiny little baby, tiny, you can't have been any more than five pounds. You were brand new when she was a tiny little baby. Didn't have any of these whiskers, didn't have any of this bright silver fur. She's this tiny little nugget. Um, I put her in my shoulder bag and brought her to the Brattle. <laughs> So that I could show them. I, I hadn't been in a while. I used to go all the time before in pre-pandemic days. I went all the time. And at one point, uh, well, three years ago now, um, I hadn't been in in a while. And they had noticed. A few of the, a few of the, uh, the staff members had noticed. And when I showed up, they said, uh, I walked up, you know, with a shoulder bag. I walked up to, to the store and they said, wow, I haven't seen you in a while. And I said, yeah, here's why. <laughs> I opened the bag and there's this little furry face staring. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway. Uh, where was I? <laughs> Before feet interrupted. Oh, right. The, just, the, just basic, basic, ordinary precautions here for for shopping at the Brattle. And in exchange, you get one of the greatest bookstores in the world. <laughs> and so I went back. <laughs> I went. I went back. Uh, yesterday, I went to the Brattle for the first time in months and months, and I was so excited. I was so happy to go there. Uh, that I, I wasn't really seeing everything, if you know what I mean. I saw, I found a bunch of great stuff, but, but I wasn't seeing everything because I was so excited. I was just, I was like a, a, a kid who's skipping through the toy store. Uh, so today I went back and did a more thorough job. Not, not complete, not a completely thorough job. There's still plenty that I could do, but I, today I went back and made a point of looking at a lot more books. Uh, and I got a ton of stuff. <laughs> I got a ton of stuff and I wanted to show them to you. Um, we'll start off with a slim novel uh, from 1984, I believe, or 1986? 1984. This is John Fox's novel, The Boys on the Rock, which has taken its place as a kind of uh, minor classic in gay fiction. But a, but a young boy, his, his sexual coming of age uh, on Long Island and uh, very, very heavily autobiographical because the the author uh, had the same kind of upbringing. Uh, this is this book is part of uh, what must have been a library that the Brattle bought uh, that have uh, the same identical, just quintessential, overpowering, glorious old books smell, fiction and nonfiction short and long, all different genres. They, they must all come from the same place. It's the exact same smell. And it's it's rather nice. <laughs> it's rather nice after after uh, months and months of being here. Uh, this is, uh, it's a debut. It has the problems with a debut. It has the problems with, with autobi autobiographical fiction. Uh, 
And it's a little heartbreaking because the author's the author's note says John Fox is from the Bronx and lives in Manhattan. His fiction has appeared for the first time in Christopher Street, and he is now working on a second novel. Uh, and we didn't see that novel. He died instead. He died in 1990 of AIDS. One of the one of the many 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 uh, artistic lives that AIDS cut short, and which feels I gotta admit extra poignant now. Uh, to, to find this book again, be reminded of it, I will reread it. It won't take any time to reread. I'll keep it this time. Uh, but to find this and to re be, be remembered that John Fox is not is not here anymore. He's not he's not a grand old man of letters the way he should be. He's just not here anymore. He died when he was young. Um, and it's extra poignant for me to remember that, you know, when we just lost Larry Kramer. So, uh, I, so when I saw this, I grabbed it. I haven't read it in uh, in quite some time. So I, I will give it... Uh, I will give it the attention that it deserves. Uh, and then I have a batch of things here, three things here that I believe are all going into this room. At least two of them certainly are. Uh, because they're all a category that I keep in this room. I have a bookcase right there of books about books and collections of book reviews and prefaces and whatnot. And that's what I found. I found a few of these things. Now, one of them isn't only that. This is uh, Max Beerbohm, and this is from uh, 1920s, I want to say. Uh, 1920, uh, and this is, uh, it has no dust jacket, it's, it's called And Even Now. Uh, I have something I can show here. Yeah, And Even Now. And this is just a collection of very short bits and pieces. Some of them are book reviews, some of them are not. Some of them are just occasional humorous essays. So this one might not make it in here a little bit. It would be a delight to, to read. A lot of these things I won't have read before. Uh, then uh, uh, the next one is from Europa Editions, and yet it's not an Europa Edition that I've ever seen. <laughs> the one that I would have loved more than any, and I don't think they ever sent this to me. I don't know when this was. Uh, 2011. So I was getting Europa. I thought I was getting them all. I never got this one. Maybe the person, the publicist at Europa, just thought I wouldn't want nonfiction. Uh, in this case, that would have been drastically wrong. This is called Second Reading uh, by Jonathan Yardley of the Washington Post. The, the classic... A Europa edition with the with the French flaps, and this is these are collections of uh, a column that Yardley did forever and ever for the Post, where he revisits older books, where he he specifically turns away from the world of new releases that so completely monopolizes reviewers. He actually says it uh, at one point, I believe, in his introduction. He says, uh, uh, "Let's see here." The fixation of journalists on the new and the trendy is a forgivable occupational hazard, but it neglects the interests of readers who want something more substantial than the latest flavor of the day. My own tastes certainly are not everybody's tastes, but the steady, heavy volume of incoming email that he got in response to this column convinced me that I had stumbled onto something that readers wanted. Uh, and and uh, I read a lot of these, but I didn't know there was a collection. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm going to reread. I'll reread. Uh, probably chunks of these. Some of them will be more familiar to me than others, and but it's definitely going in here. It's definitely going in that bookcase, which is kind of uh, worrisome because there isn't a lot of room in that bookcase. Uh, this is not going to be a case of, of book Jenga. This is going to be a case where I'm going to have to remove something. I'm going to have to redo that bookcase because I don't think there's enough room in that bookcase for all of these kinds of books, especially if I keep adding to them. Uh, then this next one also, this is uh, Ideas and Places by Cyril Connolly. Uh, which is, it's a little rough shape, but I will fix it. I fixed that Elroy Queen volume. It's now indestructible. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is not a longer work. This is not a consistent, a big, organic, longer work. This is just a collection of previously published book-related stuff that Connolly wrote. Connolly is one of the crown princes of my profession, one of the best of them all. And... Uh, this is just the typical book that book reviewers tend to do, or did tend to do <laughs> once upon a time. Uh, so you, th that will be of interest right there for me. I love books like that. But this also has miscellaneous stuff that he wrote for everybody. The, this the TLS and his own his own publication, uh, uh, Horizon. I think he tells it here. Yeah, Horizon and the TLS and Listener, Partisan Review, The New Statesman. Uh, and this has lots and lots of considerations of lots and lots of authors, two or three page considerations of authors. But this also has reprints something that I haven't read in forever that was really, really good, where Horizon sent out uh, a questionnaire to writers. I think it's called The Cost of Letters. Was that right? 
uh, here I'll hang on, hang on just a second I'll find it uh, I think it was called the cost of letters yes yes it was called the cost of letters uh, page 81 here they uh, they sent out a uh, a questionnaire with simple questions to a bunch of writers. Question number one, how much do you think a writer needs to live on? Question two, do you think a serious writer can earn this sum by his writing, and if so, how? Question three, if not, what do you think is the most suitable second occupation for a writer? Question four, do you think literature suffers from the diversion of the writer's energy into other employments, or is enriched by it? Question five, do you think the state or any institution should do more for writers? And question six, are you satisfied with your own solution to the problem and have you specific advice to give to young people who wish to earn their living by writing? And a whole bunch of people uh, answer. It's just wonderful. Elizabeth Bowen writes that uh, that they sh that it should be three thousand five hundred pounds a year net. That's what a writer needs. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, there's another one though. Uh, who was it? It's Cyril Connolly, I think. Who wrote? Yes. Uh, Cyril Connolly answers uh, the answer to the question, how much writer, money does a writer need? He says, if he is to enjoy leisure and privacy, marry, buy books, travel, and entertain his friends, a writer needs upwards of five pounds a day net. If he is prepared to die young of syphilis for the sake of an adjective, he can do on under. <laughs> That's not a whole lot has changed. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Dylan Thomas gives a great answer to the final question. I, if I remember correctly, I want to find that. A whole bunch of writers come in here. Uh, some of them write much longer than others. But if I remember, uh, Dylan Thomas is in here, and if I remember, he has a great yeah, he has a great answer to the last one. The answer to whether or not uh, uh, the advice to young people. He says, my advice to young people who wish to earn their living by writing is do. <laughs> With, in capital letters, so I'm going to re I'm going to revamp this so that it's uh, so that it's a little more shipshape. But these two at least are going to come in this room, and that adds to the uh, the ones that are already adding to that bookcase. So I'm going to have to do some rearranging. Not in not entirely. Excuse me. Not entirely the most unattractive job that a book person has to do. I know where I want these books to go, and that's going to require some space arrangement because so I'm going to have to move things around. That, that'll be fun in its own way. Uh, then else, what else do we have here? Oh yes, okay. Uh, I got a biography. This was on my mind because I just I just wrote a review of uh, of a book called The Brothers York. Big fat work about uh, Edward IV and his brother the Duke of Clarence and his, his brother Richard who became Richard III and the end of the Wars of the Roses. And it's a really good book, and I, I was loving reading about these people in, in preparation for writing my review, and also to get the old scent back. I read a couple of Richard III biographies, and I read uh, the one Edward IV biography that I have. Uh, and today at the Brattle, I found uh, the Edward IV biography that I read for, that everybody in the world read. This was, this was very popular when it came out in when? 1973. <laughs> and this is Mary Clive's book, This Son of York. Uh, so in this lovely, you know, a lovely hardcover with the with the dust jacket with all the original colors still attached and everything like this. And I confess, when I was re doing all that background reading for The Brothers York, I wanted this book. As I've read this a couple of times, and I dearly love it. And I was I was looking for it, and I knew I didn't have it, but you look anyway, and I, I didn't have it, and now I do. The timing is off for to to help me with that review, but you know, technically speaking, I didn't need any help. <laughs> technically speaking, I didn't need to read any of those books. I did it just just to get the atmosphere back. I could have reviewed the book without them, so I, the, I, I don't I don't need to be prepping for a review to want this book. Uh, then what else have we got here? Oh, all right. Uh, this there were this is the uh, there were for a while there were Oxford was doing the Oxford Book of. Victorian verse, friendship, sea stories, historical fiction, that sort of thing. This is one of my favorite ones, and I don't, uh, I had a copy in this room. It's always, well, as long as I've had this copy, it's one of the best performances in that line. I've always had it in whatever room I had, but I recently, or not recently, about four or five years ago, I got rid of the volume that I have. I sent it to somebody. So I found this again. This is the Oxford Book of Letters, uh, which I, I just love. I love reading letters anyway, and this is a fantastic collection. Well curated, I think the phrase would be. Uh, then we have a uh, mass market paperback. This was from the inside of the store. This was not out on the carts, and it was a last minute, uh, a last minute whim. 
on my part. I picked it up at the last minute because I don't, I haven't read it in forever. I'm not, I haven't read this author in forever. I don't think I've ever read this book. Uh, and like all whims, like all spur of the moment decisions that I make, it was a mistake to do because this is not going to survive. I'm not even going to try to read it. It's, it's falling apart. And I, it was in, it's in a lot worse shape than I realized when I picked it up. This is Death of a Peer by Nagayo Marsh. Uh, 1930 something. Uh, murder mystery? Is that right? Uh, 1942. Uh, but this is, this is, uh, I mean, with all the with all the best intentions in the world, this is not going to survive a read. I'm not even going to try, because I'm it'd be just my luck that I'd be getting really into the story when the book fell apart. So what I need is uh, a better version of this, a better version of Death of a Peer, a later version. Or, <laughs> since so many of you have been so incredibly generous in flooding me with EPUB eBooks, probably there's an EPUB of this thing out there somewhere. I'll, I will put the word out, see if anybody wants to send me all of Nagayo Marsh so that I don't have to worry about uh, paperback falling apart. I don't have to worry about an ebook falling apart. EPUBs are, uh, is a format, the more I read about it, the more I like it, it's a format that simply isn't going to go out of date. It's going to be updated and readapted for a long time to come. So it, it, for me, it's the way to go. It's been so, it's been so maddening. How I understand why Amazon is so proprietary and so territorial about their ebook formats. How you know they don't take much, they don't adapt to much. I understand that they want to corner the market, but EPUBs work better. And uh, so I, I will put the word out to see if not all of Nagayo Marsh, at least the death of a peer, uh, because what's the what's the point, right? In trying in going around going everywhere in used bookstores trying to find a better version of this physical book when I can get an ebook that is not going to degrade at all. <laughs> and uh, So um, that was that was a little frustrating because that's a book from the Brattle trip today that I can't actually use. I'm, I'm not even going to try. Uh, what else we got here? We have plenty more. Uh, oh, oh this, uh, this is a book that I did not know existed and that is, that is amazing to me. Uh, this is from uh, 2001. Okay, so that's a little bit of an excuse because that was before I got back into reviewing and made it my business to know everything that was out there. So there's plenty of stuff in that 25-year interregnum that I might not know about. And this is one of them. This is by Diana Price and it is Shakespeare's Unorthodox Biography, New Evidence of an Authorship Problem. This is a whole, a whole new book that I've never read before on the Shakespearean authorship controversy, the whole, that whole thing. The person who... Uh, whose book this was, has uh, mimeographed articles on the inside but, and uh, the whole nine yards. And uh, the gist here, I think, is that the, the, the author, Diana Price, obviously doesn't believe that William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon wrote the plays that we attribute to him. I forget, though, uh, I, I must have read about her book in later books of the Shakespearean authorship controversy, but I don't off the top of my head know who she picks. There is the the infamous sketch of the statue, the little the little statue in the church in Stratford on Avon, uh, that was a, a passing traveler made a sketch of the statue before the statue was remade. The statue was remade. The original statue has William Shakespeare holding a bag of barley. And the new statue, when you go to that when you go to that church, you will see that he's holding a quill pen. <laughs> uh, they changed it. Uh, that's what it did look like, and then the, the church changed it, uh, which suggests that at some point someone thought it would be much more profitable for tourism to associate that statue with a writer than with a greedy grainsman. <laughs> but one way or another, I don't think I remember what candidate Diana Price puts in place. They all do. It's the cardinal sin of Shakespeare authorship controversy wonks, is that in addition to pointing out things that they consider to be uh, inconsistencies or red flags that suggest something major is going on wrong here. In addition to doing that, that would be fun on its own. I love I love reading about that on its own. But it, it, no one's ever content just to do that. In addition to pointing out the problems with the standard Shakespeare biography, everybody has to come up with a candidate. <laughs> if it wasn't this guy, if it wasn't you know a, a, by a, an apparently illiterate grain merchant in Stratford on Avon, then who was it? who wrote the plays, when that isn't incumbent on you. 
if you if you take up the subject, you only have to point out inconsistencies. You don't have to come up with a candidate, especially since so many of the candidates are so flawed in so many serious ways. It's so much fun to read about, though. Even if you don't believe it, I don't mostly believe it myself, but uh, it's so much fun to think about. It's so much fun to read about. This is going to be a treat. Uh, and this next one is also going to be a treat. It's a big biography, and it's one that somehow or other I did not read. Even though, here, I'm going to check the date. This is going to be horrifying, though, because the date's going to be squarely in my wheelhouse. Yeah, 2012. I read this, uh, but I have not kept it. I have not reread it. You would think that I would be studying this thing. I read it mainly for two reasons uh, back in 2012. One for the subject and one for the author. And this is Deary, Bob Spitz's biography of Julia Child. Uh, and I... I uh, love Bob Spitz's books. Just love them. They're just fantastic. The back of this book is covered in praise for his biography of the Beatles. Uh, I think he's just fantastic as a writer. And I not only uh, deeply enjoyed watching Julia Child on TV, uh, even though I do not cook at all, <laughs> uh, but I also uh, had a snail mail correspondence with her in the last, in the last years of her life that was wonderful fun. I mean, I was a bookseller. I was her bookseller. She was my customer. And so didn't stray very far, but it was all about books and it was very delightful. It didn't happen that often, but I treasured it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and you would think that would mean that this would be a big favorite of mine and that I would be recommending it in every video and that I would reread it periodically, but it dropped completely off my radar after that one read. So, <laughs> so I was very happy to find it. It will go, it will go on the biography shelf. Uh, and there's another biography in here. Yes? Uh, oh yes, yes, this thing, <laughs> yes, this thing here. <laughs> Charles Haight Farnham's biography of Francis Parkman, the historian Francis Parkman here in a, this is the life of Francis Parkman. Uh, just an old school thing, this was done in 1900, I think. Yeah, 1900. And this is just a life and letters type thing about the great historian uh, who will uh, probably never be reprinted. There'll probably never, never be another big life of him uh, because he's not politically fashionable. Uh, and that appears to rule the roost now. It appears to be the way we do things now. That you, someone has to align with 21st century politics of the moment uh, or it, their works are cancelled and their life is cancelled and that's all there is to it. Uh, I think that's kind of ridiculous. I think that, I think that's kind of ridiculous. I uh, I've been absolutely horrified by all of the dyed in the wool Harry Potter fans in the last week who have been not just disavowing J.K. Rowling, but saying, you know, her books were always bad anyway. When <laughs> you organized your whole reading life around those books, and now you're saying they're bad because the author said something you don't like. Well, if the author says something you don't like, then you can say, completely justifiably, the author is bad. Okay, I had an idea of who J.K. Rowling was like as a person, and I liked her, and I don't anymore because of something that she said with which I violently disagree. But if you go further than that, if you're so caught up in cancel culture that you say not only does her comment mean she's a bad person, but it also means her books are bad, well, then you're making a prize fool of yourself. If these are things that you organized your life around and sang the praises of and told your parents to tell their lawyers to sue your teachers if they didn't teach you in English school. If, if, if these are things that you have been saying for the whole of your life are great books and now they're bad because the author says something you don't like, then what does your literary opinion mean about anything? <laughs> nothing. It means nothing about anything. You're, you're invalidating yourself. You're canceling your own self in addition to her. I've been watching that happen, and who knows who's next? <laughs> when, it, when there should be a broad, wide avenue between the two. Did you like the books or didn't you? If, if you liking the books, not only at the time, but going forward, is always inextricably linked with you liking the personal author, then what kind of a reader are you? <laughs> uh, uh, but Parkman had all the wrong ideas. He, he called... Uh, American Indian savages. He uh, he saw a scalping that that helped him to call that. He he had no high opinion of women. <laughs> that's for sure. He loved the women in his own life. He thought women en masse, the women as a group, 
were second class citizens. He, I mean, he didn't use that term, but that is what he thought. He, was, he thought they're, they're irrational, impulsive, childish. They need guidance in almost everything, and when they gather in groups, they get worse. So, of course, he was directly against, violently against, giving women the vote. And what he would have thought of a female CEO, <laughs> now, in today's world, well, maybe he'd like to think that in today's world he would imbibe the, the, the attitudes of the time and wouldn't object, but one way or another. Uh, you get an, an, old, an, an old white author who thinks that Indians are savages and that women are irrational children. It's unlikely that any, uh, that any publisher is going to green light a massive new biography of that person and who's going to reprint it. The Library of America reprinted Francis Parkman, but who will ever do it again? Who will ever do a popular paperback edition of him? I can't imagine it. Not with, not with uh, cancel culture at, its, at the, the peak of its strength. So, so it was great to get this. I am a huge fan of Francis Parkman's um, history writing. Huge fan of it. Uh, and I don't have a biography of him, so this is, this is great. This will go... I have a whole, whole bunch of these, these very old, hundred-year-old biographies of a whole bunch of uh, Boston literary figures that are gone and forgotten, and this will just add to that. Uh, and then we're, we're getting towards the end. Don't you worry. Uh, let's see here. Oh, right. Okay, then there's... Uh, when you're at the Brattle Bookshop, uh, you can indulge in your whims, especially the outdoor carts, where the variety is just infinite. You don't know what you're going to find. It's just a little something of everything. You can indulge in almost anything that you're interested in. If you're interested in um, 18th century sailing vessels, you can almost certainly, if you go often enough, you will find a book that's just about that. If you're interested in... Uh, the gardening that you can do in Connecticut. There will be a book on that. And I have a bunch of hobby horse subjects, subjects that I love to read about. And Venice is one of them, the city of Venice, the history of Venice. Venice is my second favorite place in the world. I lived there and loved it. Uh, and this is a book that I haven't read. This is by Margaret Duty. It's called Tropic of Venice. Ugly cover, but uh, because you, you don't... It's an ugly cover because Canaletto doesn't need help. Okay, he doesn't need, I don't know what that is, or what any of those things are, but he, Canaletto doesn't need help. <laughs> he's, he's just fine on his own. You, you, if you're going to pay for the rights to put a Canaletto painting on your cover, that ought to be the only thing you do. He doesn't need, you don't need to be putting people in tri-corner hats and masks on the cover. But one way or another, this is, uh, this is the University of Pennsylvania Press. This is, uh, uh, let's see here, with a novelist's eye for quirky anecdote and rich detail, with a connoisseur's eye for the secret hidden... The secret's hidden in the cut of a sleeve or the corner of a painting. The author summons the Venice of Carapaccio, Titian, Canaletto, uh, Goldini, and Casanova. She draws on comments from a myriad travelers, content, con contented or grumbling. Uh, usually a bit of both when it comes to Venice. Uh, I have a feeling I know what some of the grumbles will be in this book. I know, I've known them personally, and I've also heard them from other people. The weird accent of Venetian Italian, for instance. Just at times, especially if you get a really... If you go into a really unsullied part of the city, you, you, it doesn't seem like Italian at all. You, you'll hear it for the first for a while. It'll be like, "What? <laughs> what did you just say?" Uh, and also, uh, some of the attitudes of, of old style of Venetians who live there, not just tourists, it, 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 well, old style families, people who've been there for generations, hundreds of generations. Some of the attitudes are a little weird even by Italian standards, a little weird. Uh, a bunch of other things. The, the smell of the water, the, the living by the water, the, the high water, Aqua Alta, when it, when it floods, when the city floods. It's something that newcomers, even, even people who've been there for years, just don't get used to. <laughs> just don't get used to it. Also, the weird Venetian relationship with food, that has changed now that Venice, Venice has become basically a, a tourist trap. But for a long time before that, it was a place. It was just a place. It was a beautiful place, and plenty of tourists went there, but it, plenty of people lived there year-round that didn't think of anything about tourism. And the Venetians have an odd relationship with food. Then, they did. In the old days, they had an odd relationship with food. It was almost an afterthought to them. Very unlike the rest of Italy. Of Italy. Uh, so I imagine what I know some of those grumblings will be. I can, I can picture a lot of them. Uh, if the author is hard-pressed to find a single golden age in Venetian history, she has no difficulty in locating the city's low point in the tragic 19th century, what was once a proudly independent republic fell to a foreign power, its joy largely ceased, and it became the melancholy and somewhat sinister place evoked in the writings of Byron, uh, Dickens, and others. Venice as death's city persists into the 20th century in the works of Henry James and Thomas Mann. 
Only in the 21st century, the author suggests, might we escape that dark 19th century vision of a city once associated with glowing color and joyful music. The Queen of the Adriatic. Well, I, I am always up to read a Venice book. This thing I have not read, so I will gladly do it. Uh, and that brings us to the end. We have just the last book here. Uh, and it's a find. It's a real find. It's an Everyman Library classic, uh, like the ones on that shelf there. A lot of you have been sending me Everyman's classic hardcovers. Uh, only this is a more modern one. A lot of the ones that I've been sent have the classic painting and the square box that uh, that tells you the, name, the book and the author. Uh, but Everyman's Classic has also done a more a more modern run of things, some of which are on that shelf, uh, with a photograph overlaid by a, a kind of Art Deco screen, uh, usually of more modern authors. And this is one I am delighted, absolutely delighted to have. This is the great Muriel Spark. Uh, this is... Uh, Look at that. This is going to go right up on that shelf. So this is another book that's coming right in this room. This has The Pride of Miss Jean Brody, The Girls of Slender Means, uh, The Driver's Seat, and The Only Problem. And The Pride of Miss Jean Brody is the book that this author is, is forever linked with, totally famous for. I love The Driver's Seat. Absolutely love it as a book. And uh, the uh, what was the only, the only problem? I don't think I've read that in forever. So uh, this is going to be great. I'm, I will. This is another one of these Everyman Library volumes that I'm so glad to find. I will clean this up. It's a little bit dirty. I think it was a former library copy. Uh, yeah, it was a former library copy. Uh, I wonder if we can tell where, what library. Did they mark it at all? No, no. Probably the marking was on the plastic, but... Uh, oh, look at that. Surplus. All right, well, <laughs> your loss is my gain. Uh, so there you go. That was uh, another Brattle trip full of books. <laughs> so, uh, so we have Shakespeare's Unorthodox Biography. I've got the glare going on here. Sorry about that. Uh, where the author examines the, sh the, author the authorship controversy. Who knows? Will this end up being my favorite book on the subject? I have read a lot of them. Uh, then the Oxford Book of Letters. That's going to go right in this room. This Son of York. Uh, Mary Clive's biography of Edward IV. That will go on. I will then require more book Jenga because I've got to find room for it in the royal section of my biography shelf. Uh, then let's see. Uh, Tropic of Venice. Uh, a Life of Francis Parkman. A biography of Julia Child, Deary, by Bob Smith. I strongly recommend his book on the Beatles. Uh, an Everyman's Library collection of Muriel Spark. Uh, Ideas and Places by the great Cyril Connolly. Uh, second reading by the not so sh not so shabby Jonathan Yardley. Uh, let's see here, and even now by Max Beerbohm, the, the uh, Edwardian humorist, and the Boys on the Rock by John Fox, who is alas no longer with us. Uh, and there you go. Oh, plus uh, plus Death of a Peer <laughs> by Nagayo Marsh, which I don't even want near the others because it's just going to fall apart. I, I'm not going to try anything with it. Uh, and there you go. That was. That was my second trip to the Brattle of this week. <laughs> I keep telling myself that I'm not going to go back. <laughs> I'm not going to go back for the rest of the week. That's yes, I missed going book hunting, but that would be a little excessive. I've made, I've, I've brought home an, almost a whole bookcase, a little bookcase of books. We shall see. <laughs> we shall see if my self-control holds up. Uh, but either way, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.